afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I want to thank you all for your presence. Uh, what a joy it is to be able to gather together. Uh, um, we're honored to have Father Antonio Spadaro, journalist, theologian, Jesuit leader, to offer reflections on the church's mission in a world in crisis. And I want to thank our colleagues in the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs for bringing us together. We welcome Father Spadaro for a timely and important address on the work of the Catholic Church in our world. Over these past few, few decades, he's played an invaluable role in reporting, interpreting, and promoting the global mission of the church. For 25 years, he served at La Civita Cattolica, first as a contributor, then a staff writer, before spending the last 12 years as editor-in-chief of the Jesuit magazine. This past fall, he was appointed by Pope Francis to serve as the undersecretary of the Vatican's Dicastery for Culture and Education, where he will help to advance the church's mission of engagement in the world. He began in this role in January. We've been privileged to have Father Spadaro's leadership in our community. He recently served as a member of our board of directors, and during his years at La Civita Cattolica, he collaborated with our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs on convenings exploring different perspectives on global affairs. He has developed a close relationship with the Holy Father, Pope Francis, since his early days as Pope. Many of you will remember a few months after Pope Francis assumed the papacy, Father Spadaro conducted the first major interview with the new Pope, which was simultaneously published in Jesuit journals around the globe. It was in this interview with Father Spadaro that Pope Francis described the church's global mission. And Father Spadaro recounts the words of, of the Holy Father. And I quote, I see clearly, the Pope continues, that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. You have to heal the wounds, then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds, and you have to start from the ground up. Close quote. Over these years, Father Spadaro has grown to become a trusted advisor to the Holy Father, accompanying him on his international travels and in meetings with Jesuit communities around the globe. These experiences have given him deep insights into the vision of Pope Francis, which he has shared, publishing interviews and articles that offer new insights about Pope Francis and the church. He recently edited a three-volume set of homilies and speeches by Pope Francis from his years as Archbishop Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio, and he co-authored a children's book with the Pope, Dear Pope Francis, The Pope Answers Letters from Children from Around the World. He's here this afternoon to share his reflections on the mission of the church in this moment, a decade into Pope Francis's global leadership to share the Pope's vision for the church as a field hospital and the important work we must continue to, in the words of Pope Francis, heal the wounds, and warm the hearts. So Father Spadaro, you've helped our community deepen our engagement with our Catholic and Jesuit identity in so many different ways, and we're grateful for your partnership and your presence over these years. We're honored to have you here with us this afternoon. It is my pleasure to invite to the podium Father Antonio Spadaro. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thanks all of you for being here tonight. The topic is very heavy, the church's mission in a world in crisis. And uh, starting thinking about the topic, I recall that on November the 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. From that day on, thousands of Berliners demolished the symbol that had held them hostage for nearly three decades. That date symbolizes the demise of totalitarianism. A new era seemed to be dawning, marked by globalization. Instead, 
indifference and conflict characterize our world now, as Pope Francis often repeats. While one wall has collapsed, many others have arisen worldwide. Just a few days ago, in an Easter message, Urbi et Orbi, Francis said, Today, great heavy stones block humanity's hopes. The stone of war, the stone of a humanitarian crisis, the stone of human rights violations, the stone of human trafficking, and other stones as well. Like the women disciples of Jesus, we ask one another, who will roll the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? An effective synthesis of Francis' global political vision can be found in the trajectory of his trips that follow the peripheries because these are the places of open wounds. Apostolic journeys allow the Pope to make gestures of global therapeutic value. It's incredible to be with them during these papal trips, seeing with my own eyes how he acts and how he is, he is eager to touch with his own hands the wounds and the walls. I remember Auschwitz, for example, and many others. When Francis, in my interview with him in 2013 for La Civiltà Cattolica, uh, spoke of the church as a field hospital after a battle, he did not mean to use a nice, rhetorically effective image. What he had before his eyes was already the scenario of what he calls a third world war thought piecemeal. He uh, invented this definition in 2014, which means just one year after his election. In, uh, by February 2022, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this Third World War had emerged as a brutal reality and has since taken on a new and terrible violent character in Israel and Gaza. In one conflict, the threat of nuclear war is being evoked. In the other, massacres of civilians are being justified with arguments deemed plausible by one side or the other. It's a kind of madness. We are living a time of madness. Today seems we are only laying a solid foundation for generations of hatred. This is the real crux of the issue. The positive vision of a hope-filled future is disappearing. There is an expression of Francis that often comes back to me. The world is crumbling. This is taken by Laudate Deum, just at the beginning. There is kind of an apocalyptic, apocalyptic vision of the world. The world is crumbling. The familiar order has been disrupted, and what will happen next is unclear. Sometimes he even said that we need new language, a new language, new images. He asked even the artists to help us to have a new language and new images for describing the situation we are living. The global crisis takes various forms and express itself in interstate and civil wars, falling regimes and failed states, migration flows and barbed wire. It threatens new alliances and, tra and trade routes that promise prosperity and generate tensions. Any map of these open and bleeding wounds will always be incomplete. It's interesting that every single year in his Urbi et Orbi message, Pope Francis make a list of these wounds, which is very painful. 
Amid the Third World War thought piecemeal, Paul Francis invites us to reflect on the nature of war itself. All is lost in war, he is fond of saying. All is lost in war. While he has not abandoned the church's just war doctrine, he insisted in his 2020 encyclical Fratelli Tutti that today it's hard to sustain the rational criteria developed over the centuries to justify the use of force, especially in light of the destructive power of nuclear weapons technologies. One can only argue the legitimacy of defending oneself militarily if one is attacked under certain conditions, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church published long ago by St. John Paul II states. Among those conditions, are there are these two. There must be serious prospects of success. And the, the second, the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. The power of modern means of destruction weighs very heavily in evaluating this condition. This last condition today is becoming increasingly relevant to evaluate. Francis' aversion to the use of military force does not make him an abstract and ideological pacifist. A student of history, he knows that conflict is inevitable and ineradicable in human affairs. So he's not naive. He knows very well that conflicts, uh, that conflict is part of our nature. And this is true also uh, in relations, in relations uh, among states. Peace for Jorge Mario Bergoglio involves, he said, real struggle. That struggle goes beyond diplomatic or military issues to address the roots of injustice and the needs of marginalized people worldwide. When Francis personally intervenes in uh, international political debates, he does so forcefully and in innovative ways that generate a sense of astonishment or some real bewilderment. Bergoglio is a Christian leader. And only as such can he speak about politics and diplomacy. He is not one of the many political leaders of the world. He is the Pope. His pontificate is prophetic because it accompanies the movement of time and its relationship to God and gives meaning to the transcendent. Established worldly expectations of a leader's role on the world stage too often misunderstand his interventions. As a believer, Francis approaches the world as God's domain. He sees his task as a pontiff, accompanying historical processes rather than offering ready-made solutions. Considering his role as a spiritual leader, let us return to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Pope's uh, words about Ukraine have not been adequately understood. The Pope's message is clear, and he repeated it until a few days ago in the Urbi et Orbi message. I call for respect for the principles of international law. And this is a very clear message. He continually talks about the martyr of Ukraine. The Pope never said that Ukraine should just surrender. He recently spoke of a ray of a rising the white flag only to open negotiations and find a solution to a conflict for which there is no end in sight. He appeals for negotiations and talks. Francis calls for the courage to pause the fighting and accept the help of willing international mediators. 
This has nothing to do with an unconditional surrender, which would be out of the question, given the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian people. The Pope never called for unconditional surrender. Francis understands the love of the homeland and the importance of defending it against aggression. I quote him verbatim. To defend oneself is not only licit, but also an expression of love of the fatherland. He who does not defend something does not love it. Instead, he who defends loves. Like his predecessors, the Pope's perspective in all wars is that of a father. This is very important to understand. His vision, his perspective, is not a perspective of a politician, but it's a perspective of a father. Francis enfolds the aggressor and victims into his prayer. He acts according to the gospel spirit, which is one of reconciliation, even against all visible hope during this war of aggression. As he once tweeted, the Lord does not divide us into good and bad, friends and enemies. For him, we are all beloved children. For Francis, the church's task is not to adapt to the dynamics of the world politics. He calls that worldliness, mundanita, worldliness. He also know that any effort to eliminate evil would be futile, as it would simply manifest itself elsewhere in other forms. Evil is part of our life and the life of the world. Pretending to make it disappear is a dangerous illusion, resulting from a misguided idealism that prevents us from finding workable solutions. The Pope believes in processes that develop over time that can address and neutralize evil rather than overcome it. Precisely here lies what we might call the dialectic of Bergoglian action. What emerges in practice is the approach of a spiritual leader with a particular understanding of international relations informed by the gospel. When he talks about diplomacy, as he did in his private meeting in May 2018 at the Ecclesiastical Academy, he affirms that his approach is fundamentally a diplomacy of the knees, rooted and grounded in prayer. And he was talking to the, uh, the, the, the nuncio's information. So he called it an diplomacy of knees. You need to pray in order to be a good diplomat of the Holy See. To understand Francis international politics is to immerse, immerse oneself in a spiritual vision nourished by a deep awareness of the current crisis, the potential for catastrophe and the reality of evil in the world. At the same time, a unique trust in the mystery of God leads one to accept worldly realities. Small steps, trials, talks, negotiations, long processes, difficult encounters, and uncertain mediations. To some, such an approach may seem untenable. However, we should keep Francis' theological frame front and center as both a personal conviction and a characteristic of his papal office. For Francis, world history is not a typical Hollywood blockbuster. The good guys are not set against the bad guys, the goodies and the baddies at every turn. International politics are complex, with multiple and competing interests at stake. That is why Francis does not enter networks of pre-established alliances. 
He wants to maintain the proper relationship between political and spiritual values. The Pope refuses the binary logic that distinguishes radically and clearly between the forces of good and the forces of evil. He emphasizes the importance of working for the common good, which no nation or politician can possess in its entirety. In this sense, Francis trusts only in the eschatological future, God alone, and not in political powers claiming to save the world. But it is precisely this trust, the sense of the openness, openness of history and its hopeful direction in the long term that puts aside all false illusions of a clear path to the peaceable kingdom. It's precisely this trust, trust that emphasizes dialogue and encounter processes that can lead people on the path towards the great good, even amid evil. For Francis, no one, not even any worldly power, is the absolute evil that is the incarnation of the devil. No one. This is admittedly scandalous for many, as it leaves a door open, sometimes narrow, but open nonetheless, to peace and reconciliation, even in the most difficult situations. The community of faith never turns into a community of faith. And we can never think about holy war, which is the opposite of the gospel message. In terms of holy war, God would end up as the ideal projection of established power. The nation would become the chosen people. Faith would set it against those who do not belong to it that is the enemy. It's characteristic, for example, of the Jihadism, but also of neo-Crusaders forms of supremacism in Western countries. From the gospel perspective, faith cannot generate a human enemy. And the first commandment, anyway, is to love your enemy. To love your enemy. This is why to Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, Francis said, the church must not use the language of politics, but the language of Jesus, which is the language of reconciliation, peace, and love. In summary, we can say that Francis' diplomacy is a diplomacy of mercy, which means never, ever considering anything or anyone as definitively lost in relations between nations, people, and states. This is the core of his understanding of the church's role in world affairs. Never, ever considering anything or anyone as lost in relations between nations, people, and states. This does not mean, of course, a retreat into spiritual platitudes or prayerful isolation. Instead, it translates into diplomacy that is always sowing and never cutting. It's a kind of a tailoring diplomacy, which does not claim to have all the, solution, the solutions in its pocket. Its goal is to understand the roots of conflict and to remain available as an interlocutor for a possible reconciliation of the parties. For the Mother Church, all people, good and bad, are always children of God and brothers and sisters to one another. It's important never to forget this perspective when judging the Holy See's actions. I want to recall now with you just two examples. One is very recent. 
At the end uh, of the Wednesday, March 27 audience, Francis thanked Rami Ella, Ella Nan and Bassam Aramin, the former Israeli and the latter Palestinian, for their testimony. They suffered the loss of their daughters in the war in the Holy Land. It was 1997 when Rami suffered the atrocious loss of his 14-year-old daughter in a terrorist attack. In 2007, when the same fate befell Bassam, whose 10-year-old um, daughter was killed by a soldier's bullet as she was leaving school. Francis said, and here today at this audience, there are two people, two fathers, one Israeli and the other Arab. Both of them lost their daughters in the war, and they are friends. They do not look at the wickedness of war, but rather they look at the friendship between two men who care about each other and have experienced the same crucifixion. Let us think of the beautiful witness of these two people who have suffered the war in the Holy Land in the loss of their daughters. Dear brothers, thank you for your witness. A similar encounter had taken place at the Via Crucis at the Colosseum in Rome on April 15, 2022, when the cross was carried together by a Ukrainian woman and a Russian woman, Albina and Irina, who were friends before the war and remained so after its outbreak. They did not say a single word, not even a request for forgiveness or anything like that, nothing. They just stood under the cross in carrying it. Francis, by putting together under the cross these two women, fulfilled his task as a Catholic, that is, universal pastor. Thus, he saved the Catholicity of his faith and his church, sheltering it from the swamp of nationalism. Some felt the gesture as scandalous, but this is preaching the gospel of Christ. The Holy See insists on the importance of multilateralism in dealing with hot topics and crises. It insists on the surrendering to the dead-end logic of a military escalation of patterns of war, as the Pope calls them. To embrace multilateralism, which means nations and international institutions working in concert to resolve inevitable conflicts peacefully, is to reject a policy based on spheres of influ influence like the one established at Yalta at the end of World War II. It requires the effort to imagine rethinking the architecture of international relations. It's a huge effort that goes hand in hand with a possible reform of the United Nations, which John Paul II and Benedict XVI called for already. The challenges we are experiencing cannot be addressed by single governments alone in an overly litigious and inconclusive condominium system. A reform of the Security Council is the most urgent reform to take back the governance of peace. In his apostolic exhortation from last year, Laudate Deum, Francis builds an effective bridge between his theological lens and his view of international politics as an interplay of different forces that can be coordinated for the universal common good. Not through the will of the stronger, but through a culture of encounter that acknowledges the inevitability of conflict, but also identifies peaceful means for resolving inevitable differences. Francis writes, our world has become so multipolar and simultaneously so complex that a different framework 
for effective cooperation is required. It's not enough to think only of balances of power, but also of the need to respond to new problems and to react with global mechanisms. So more than saving the old multilateralism, it appears that the current challenge is to reconfigure and recreate it, taking into account the new world situation. In the medium term, this is uh, still Francis, in the medium term, globalization favors spontaneous cultural interchanges, greater mutual knowledge, and processes of integration of people, which end up provoking a multilateralism from below, and not simply one determined by the elites of power. The demands that rise up from below throughout the world, where activists from very different countries help and support one another, can end up pressuring the sources of power. The great world religions have a great responsibility within the larger geopolitical context to advance the peaceful coexistence of people. Francis firmly believes in this, and as a result, he works tirelessly to ensure the interfaith dialogue rejects any temptation to tear apart the civil fabric and prevents the exploitation of religion for political purposes. Francis told world religious leaders at a meeting in Kazakhstan, we do not allow the sacred to be instrumentalized by what is profane. The sacred should never be a prop for power and power should never be a prop for the sacred. The Pope no longer symbolically crowns any king or political leader as defense or fide, the chosen one sent by God. This is kind of a political rhetoric on our days. And many political leaders, even in Italy, uses, are using this rhetoric, which is a precise uh, and awful use of the religion for uh, uh, politics. So uh, um, in, in this sense, uh, St. Peter is St. Francis. This is, we should see, uh, when we see Francis, we see Peter as a pope. But if we look carefully, we see St. Francis in the chair of St. Peter, which is puzzling sometimes. But it's true. This is the specific role of Francis as a pope on our times, to wear the, um, the, 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 the image, to be the image of St. Francis as a Peter. And sometimes this is very puzzling, because we have the image of power instead of the image of service. Even his way of uh, the, to use the cassock, no? which is very simple. No? And even the liturgical uh, um, dresses, how do you say, the, the vestments. No? The vestments is very simple. Everything is simple. So the image that he is given of the pontificate is a very simple image. It's this image of St. Francis more than the image we are used to, um, we are custom, accustomed to. For some, this is a scandal, this is an, kind of an oxymoron, that is the stumbling block in reading the pontificate. So the hollow of St. Francis, a poor Christian, coincides with, the, uh, with that of the Vicar of Christ. With it, the Pope forever abandons the profile of the Roman Emperor, which is a very historical shift. Even when he appeared uh, uh, on the loggia of St. Peter, when he was elected, he never had uh, anything read 
on him. And the symbol of the Roman emperor is not white, the color white, it's the red. So he refuses, refused since the beginning the image of the emperor. If anything, perhaps Dante, Dante Alighieri, who in the Monarchia connects the Pope's spiritual authoritas, authority directly with paternitas, paternity, comes to mind. The primacy is expressed in the power of the church to make herself radically humble, poor, and evangelical. That means appearing to the world naked, powerless, and crucified. Only a church that openly confesses that it is not the city of God and rejects any compromise in the management of political power will still be able to be heard and counted in the secular world. In this sense, Poli Lai, who in the New York Times in 2018 published a piece titled Francis, the Anti-Strongman, is right. Very much in keeping with St. Francis' model, Paul Francis insists that peace initiatives in a world experiencing a dramatic third world war thought piecemeal must always be linked to the two major social issues of greatest concern to the Pope, social peace and the inclusion of the poor. What Francis told the US Congress during his visit in 2015 also relates to global society. A political society, he said, endures when it strives as its vocation to meet common needs by stimulating the growth of all its members, especially those at the greatest vulnerability or risk. Inside these words, of his is a profound meditation on the discourse on the last judgment in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel, one of the passages that have always been at the heart of Francis' magisterium. Mercy is the love that experiences the mystery of another as if it were its own. Examples of issues where Francis links international diplomacy with the church's social mission include migration and refugees. Advocating for peace can never mean silence in the face of social injustice. Taking up St. Paul VI encyclical Popularum Progressio from 1967, Francis expresses the conviction that a peace does, does not, um, that doesn't arise as a fruit of integral development of all will not even have a future and will always be a seed of new conflicts and various forms of violence. This is Evangelii Gaudium. Peace is not a goal to be achieved, but only the first step, the condition of development and overcoming injustice. Peace for Francis is not based on a simple desire for social order. This would be a pseudo-justice. On the contrary, as he said in Colombia, peace arises from the desire to resolve the structural causes of uh, poverty that generate exclusion and violence. This is the only way to heal a disease that makes society fragile and unworthy and always leaves it on the threshold of a new crisis. Let us not forget that injustice is the root of social ills. So peace is the condition of the development and the overcoming of injustice. From the supreme common good of peace flows the protection and guarantee of many other inalienable rights, including those to life, food, justice, freedom of worship, and religious belief. Without peace, none of these rights would be possible. Remember Francis' appeal at the Congress during his visit to Washington nine years ago? He insisted that our response to the world must be a response of hope and healing of peace and justice. 
This lecture, I talked about crisis because Francis shares the widespread conviction that we live through a deep world affairs crisis. In his address to the Roman Curia, the presentation of greetings for Christmas 2020, Pope Francis mentioned the world crisis 46 times. He insisted that the crisis is no longer a commonplace of conversations and of the intellectual establishment. It has become a reality experienced by everyone. That was 2020. So um, right after uh, the pandemic, but then we know what happened afterwards. However, for the Pope, the term crisis does not have a negative connotation per se. For him, crisis is a phenomenon that affects everyone and everything. It's present everywhere and in every period of history. It involves ideolo ideologies, politics, economics, technology, ecology, and religion. For Francis, crisis is a fundamental human experience in an obligatory stage of personal and social history. There is no way to avoid it, to avoid crisis. Crisis for Francis has a solid theological dimension. He recalls scripture, which is populated by characters in crisis, who by living through it, fulfilled the history of salvation. You can think about Abraham, Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Paul, St. Paul, and Jesus himself, particularly during the temptations and then in the indescribable crisis in Gethsemane. Loneliness, fear, anguish, Judas' betrayal, and the abandonment of the apostles until the extreme crisis of the cross. So Francis, uh, as a dialectic view of history informed by the gospel. It is as if he is saying that if there is no crisis, there is no life. In this sense, crisis evokes hope. Hence his message, it's necessary to be realistic in time of crisis. And a reading of reality without hope cannot be called realistic. Hope gives to our analysis what so many times our myopic gazes are incapable of perceiving. To Francis, crisis is never, ever the opposite of hope. It might be an opening for a new departure. We too can keep hope alive in our hearts despite the dark times we are experiencing to make a better world. Thank you.